we bring you greetings from Berlin Church, the Wall Breakers. My name is Thomas, this is my lovely wife Danka, and uh, it's a great privilege to be preaching to you guys here in London. The title of our lesson is Greater Evangelism and Follow Up. Turn with me to Matthew 10. You know, I believe in order to have a not just good follow-up and evangelism, but a great one, we need to learn from the greatest man that ever walked this planet, which is Jesus Christ. Now, when I think of Jesus' ministry, Jesus worked hard, but he also worked smart. And in Matthew 10, when he's sending out his main guys, he gives them a very specific instruction that we're going to observe today and learn from them. Matthew 10 verse 11 says this, Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. You know, Berlin is our second mission team and the third church that we're helping to build. And I'll tell you something, you know, being on a mission team is not always easy. And especially because I don't know anybody as soon as I step on the new land. And these men were sent out to a completely foreign country, uh, uh, territory, completely foreign cities. Now, what were the instructions? Search for one worthy soul. One, not ten, one. After you find that person, you stay in that person's house and influence everybody around them. That was Jesus' strategy as far as I can read, right? <laughs> Now you say, well, I'm, I'm a bit doubtful. You know, I bet that Jesus was just focused on many people. Well, let's, let's look at what Jesus did in John 1. Now, John 1 is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. How did he do it? Well, first of all, he has this first two guys, which is John and Andrew, being recommended by John the Baptist, his cousin. So he used his social network to gain his first couple of disciples. What did he do after? After that, Andrew goes and picks up his brother Peter, he brings him to Jesus. Still, Jesus didn't reach, Jesus didn't reach out to any of them, it's Andrew bringing, uh, bringing Peter. What happens afterwards? Philip, the guy from the same village as all these three guys, comes and joins Jesus' ministry, an another part of his network. What happens after? Philip goes and reaches out to Nathaniel, who's skeptical, just like most of us Europeans, amen? <laughs> amen? But he still comes. Why? Because of relationship with Philip. This is how Jesus gained some of his most influential people and leaders in his ministry. His leadership was all about, let me influence people around me so they can go and influence their social circles. It wasn't so much about, do you want to study the Bible? Do you want to study the Bible? Do you want to study the Bible? It was more about keeping close relationships and reaching people through him. In the, in the words of Tim Kernan, he said, first century church exploded along pre-existing social channels. And there were three main ones. You had house churches, these huge Roman villas where tens of people would live. One person would become a Christian, that household is getting baptized. All of them. You had a second, second group, which is synagogues. After 200, it took 200 years for Christians to be kicked out from synagogues completely. Before that, they were being used to reach other people so they can be saved. And the third one is obviously campus, amen? amen? Now, what's the lesson there? And why am I speaking about this? Because I, I believe that the, the, the three churches that we helped to build, I've noticed a principle. And that is, the Bible talks or the churches grew when everybody's doing work. Not just one man. It's not the Bible talks that have this one hero, this MVP, but it's the Bible talk that everybody's doing the work. And now let's be honest. Some of us are full-time ministers like me and my wife, but some of us can be. But that's where you can reach out your old friends, your colleagues, your classmates. This is where we need to invest. And we as leaders need to help our people to invest into every single one of them. Amen? If there's one point for you guys, it is evangelize to capitalize. We got to capitalize on every single conversion that we have in our church. I believe it is self-righteous to say, do you know what? Now you're baptized, come with me to campus, leave all your friends behind. It is self-righteous and Satan is quarantining disciples and they're losing the influence that Jesus wants them to have on their social network. I spoke to Kip once and I asked him, 
Kip, how did you let this, the, all, these, all these ministries, and he said, you know what, if I would get to a new campus, I would get to dorms, and I would not know anybody there. So I'd literally go door knocking until I find one person that allows me to host his Bible talk at his place. I wouldn't study the Bible with him. I would just hold my Bible talk in his place until few people get baptized, and then I'm ready to study the Bible with him. I believe Kip is living out this principle, and look at what he done with us. Now, how did that work out in our ministry before I gave it to my wife? In Amsterdam, I've, it took some time till we baptized Ruben. Ruben is an incredible man. He's a white, white Dutch student. Now, after he got baptized, a couple months later, his best friend got baptized. Also white Dutch. After that, you give it a few months, and another man who was uh, this friend's uh, sister's classmate got baptized as well. Another white Dutch man. All of these, almost all of these had no faith before. But what happened? Through this social network, one after another got baptized. We're doing the same thing now in Berlin. Lauren got baptized. Now his best friend, best drinking buddy, ex-drinking buddy, got, uh, is getting baptized. He wants to get baptized. Clearly no faith, also white and German. I believe through this, we're not only going to get additions, but we're going to be able to influence nations. And this is what we're looking for. I'll give it to my wife to share for women. Sisters, how to go from good to great evangelism and follow-up? Good question. <laughs> I believe that we need to remove all that blocks us hmm. from going after it. And what can stop us from going after it, either in our social circles, as my husband mentioned, or, you know, with strangers, I believe it's our own desires. Hmm. And why do I say that? I will be very real because I see it in myself. Mm. As soon as there is something else on my mind than Jesus' mission, my evangelism and my follow-up slows down. Mm. And I will read the scripture in James um, 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, on, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Mm. And you can see in this scripture, you have a good and bad angel on your shoulders. So basically, <laughs> the scripture says that desires fight inside of you. So mm. this battle is inside of us that is stopping us. Mm. So my very simple point for you, sisters, is... Where there is a will, there is a way. Come on. And so when you have a will, you want a pretty hair, you will have it. <laughs> and when you have a will to help someone, you will do it. Mm. The problem is not that we don't know how to. The problem is it, that we don't desire it so badly. Mm. And um, on, I, have, <laughs> I have few examples. I wanted to respond to this friend who texted me, but I wanted to share with that person sitting next to me in the bus, but <laughs> I wanted to invite all my contacts to the Christmas service, but <laughs> we think we have a valid reason, but we make emotional decisions, which we then rationalize. Mm. And instead, <laughs> and instead, I want to give you a challenge that has been helping me recently, and it's a yes, I do challenge. <laughs> so basically, all the sisters want to, uh, you know, hear this question, uh, <laughs> respond to this question when we are getting married. Yes, I do. Um, so I ask myself a question about like when I'm going to follow up or when I'm going to share my faith if I struggle in that moment, and I ask, do I love God? Yes, I do. Do I want to serve God? Yes, I do. Do I want to obey God? Yes, I do. And then after you answered all these questions, you can just go one, two, three, and do. So basically, 
this can help you to overcome your emotions and your desires and your thinking and all of that is just go to the point. And of course, many things that um, we desire are valid. We need to take care of our kids. We need to, you know, sort out our housing situation. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, there is many things that are not necessary. So for example, not sharing with our colleagues because we just don't want to look bad or be excluded. Mm -hmm. What is your desire in that moment? You want to see, be cool and collected. Um, not following up on your friends from the world because you don't want to lose the friendship. Um, is because, yeah, your desire is just uh, selfish. Mm -hmm. So are you leading yourself to temptation? or someone else to salvation. We are not here just to stay faithful another year. And I know that you as a godly woman have this desire. You have big, big hearts mm. for God. And we can overcome together this constant battle of what about my X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So remember the yes, I do challenge. And whatever is a hindrance in your mind, you need mm. to deal with it. So clear your mind, you know, have a plan so you can focus. Or if it's a temptation, confess and repent and uh, my third practical is don't forget to pray. Amen. To God go. Amen. Let us not forget, let's share, but also capitalize on people that are getting saved and to God be all the glory. Greater